a lot of times what it does come down to is relationship, and like Russell had said, footprint. Footprint is very important because people, whether they like it or not, there are people that are there for ideological reasons, but on a vast majority of bills, which is, just so you know, um, gosh, there are, there are typically about 1,000 bills introduced every legislative session. I took about 2,000 vote, 2, votes every year, so a total of about 4,000, 4, 4,500 votes. Most of those votes are the nuts and bolts of government. And when we talk about um, the oversight of healthcare facilities, of hospice care, when we talk about licensure issues, particularly when we're going to get into the two health committees, the Senate Health Committee and the House Com Health Committee, as you can imagine, those are typically some of our most intense, we call them food fights in the legislature. For example, I remember one bill, it was the optometrist versus the ophthalmologist. On, uh, it was a, whether or not the optometrist, I'll get this right, should be able to get, uh, um, issue a uh, Schedule One drug. And you can imagine it's not just ideological theory at that point. It is ophthalmologists showing up and saying, if you do this, it is going to cost me X number of dollars. It's not a licensure issue just at that point. And the ophthalmologist is saying, well, if you do this, it's going to gain us X number of dollars. And so whenever we talk about licensure oversight issues, particularly in the health care, those become incredibly important because there are so many lives and so much money tied to them. And so be, please be aware of that. Now one member, when I give you a broad overview, we've all seen you know, the Schoolhouse Rock, there's a, the House, the Senate, Governor, and, and, and a typical process that we'll go through. Please be aware that there are only three numbers <coughs> that actually matter at the Capitol. Sixteen, thirty-one, one. Can anyone tell me what these numbers actually are? Any guess? Just a guess out there. I'll give you a hint. There's thirty senators, sixty House members, and one governor. That's the quorum, I guess. Majority. Majority. Yeah. Majority. So the key when we talk about all the process, remember, sixteen senators controls the Senate, thirty-one representatives controls the House of Representatives, and you need a governor. Nothing that you can do, pass a, budget, pass a bill, pass a resolution creating Cowboy Day. You cannot do any of those things without these numbers right here. Now, they're, they're, these are the hardcore votes. Now, I'll, I'll explain kind of the rough legislative process, and you're going to see a lot of nuances. And just so you know, when you're talking about a bill and I go through the legislative process, it's incredibly easy to kill a bill, delay a bill, um, get rid of a bill, much more difficult to pass a bill. So of those 1,000 bills that I said were introduced, about 200 to 250 actually become law. I was very fortunate, um, last, my last year about 10 of them were mine. Uh, they were very, very good bills that I enjoyed running. But running a bill is not just the idea of putting something on paper and we all love it. It is actually very difficult work because it's not just you. I had to get at least 30 other members, 16 of these, and the governor to support it. Now with that, what would happen now, the Arizona legislator is very different. It's not a full-time legislator, so the other reason it's so difficult to pass legislation and so, um, oh, it just takes so much effort is because we have a very compressed time frame. We actually try and do all of our legislation within 10 to 12 weeks. So what we have is um, when you introduce a bill, and we'll talk through that process, Basically, three things need to happen. Actually, I'll, I'll go through the process and we'll put the timelines on it. Uh, the first thing you need is a member, a champion. The only person that can introduce a bill is a legislative member, a senator or a representative. Now, the other things we are going to talk about a little bit is there's administrative changes you can do. You can get the director of the Department of Health Services to make a change. You can put something in the budget and you don't necessarily need these numbers. But what will happen is that member, say you wanted to create a license change. You would need to find a member, like Chris Ackerley, who's going to be speaking later on, and get that member so excited that they are willing to put their name and their champion and they're going to go to that member. At that point, before any of this starts, and this is actually all happening right now. For example, as the, as the Board of Regents, uh, who, who is my governing body, oh, that was about two or three months ago, already adopted our legislative agenda. We have already been promoting our legislative agenda. If you want a bill to pass, that bill needs to be written now, just so you know. At that point, you have what's called legislative council. This is all before the introduction. And they will actually, the team of lawyers designed to write the bill. And so they're the ones that actually write it. They put it, it's called an intro set, an introductory set. 
They'll draft it, and they can give you permission if you have an ally, or if you find an ally that wants to support you, they can actually open the door, and they can say, why don't you meet with legislative council, and you draft the bill. So you can actually, as a, as a citizen, if the representative gives you that authority, you have the ability to help draft the bill. Once that's drafted, they go, they sponsor it, they, they can put their name on it, get co-sponsors, and introduce it. Once the bill is introduced, it's actually formally introduced, it's one of those thousand bills that I talked about, and we do what's called first read. Now at that point, if it's in the Senate, it goes to the President, if it goes to the Speaker, or the House, it goes to the Speaker. The Speaker at that point assigns it to committees. So that is probably the most difficult aspect about passing a bill. Almost anything that you're dealing with is going to go through the Health Committee, which is Heather Carter, the Chair of the House Health Committee, and Nancy Bartow, Senator Bartow, the Chair of the Senate. Health Committee. Basically, the, the best way of explaining it is, um, and, and I'm a Christian, so I don't mean this in any sort of disrespectful way, the committee chair is God of their committee. The speaker, the, the speaker and the president has absolute authority to assign and to assign committee chairs. The committee chair has absolute authority over what bills are heard. They set the agenda. There have been, I, I served on judiciary, and there was a uh, one of the bills that the chair of the judiciary did not like the way the hearing was going, a bill that he did not approve of was going to pass. I was one of the people going to support it, and the testimony was in favor of the bill, and in the middle of the hearing, the chair said, you know what, I'm holding this bill, we're not voting on it, the bill's dead. And that's how much authority the chair has. So you need to understand the chair is an incredibly important ally. Um, in the, the House dynamics at this level, uh, Heather Carter tends to be more of a moderate liberal Republican. Nancy Bartow tends to be a more of a conservative uh, Goldwater Republican. So you can imagine they don't see eye to eye. Now one thing to remember, and this is how a lot of the deals get done that Russell and I were talking about behind the scenes, you don't, you have to, every bill in the Senate has to go to the House. Every bill in the House has to go to the Senate. And so that's where the real horse trading begins. So you can have a House health chair that is championing a bill that the Senate health chair doesn't necessarily agree with, but doesn't necessarily oppose, who at that point can absolutely, absolutely say, you know what, I'll tell you what, this happens all the time. You hear one of mine, I'll hear one of yours. And so that is, um, after the bills flip, that is actually a very delicate dance that happens between the House and the Senate. Because it's not just a split among R's and D's, North and South in Arizona. There really is a very true interplay between the Senators and the Republicans. Because everything you do here, and I've seen bills with more than 50 votes, almost 60 votes in the House, come over here and absolutely die in the Senate because they didn't work the Senate ahead of time and vice versa. And I've also seen a number of bills die because they didn't take the time to give the governor the courtesy call. If the governor vetoes something, it's dead. Do not bring that back. And I'll, then that's basically because of our contents front of my mind. So once the bill is introduced, the speaker or the president has the ability to assign the bill to committees. And, and this is how you can kill a bill without killing a bill. You have to get through every committee that the speaker assigns you to, whether it be one or whether it be three. You have to get through all the committees before you go ahead. So, and I know this is very basic, so please inter uh, ask me questions if there's something a little bit more nuanced you want to ask. The Speaker or the President has absolute authority. They could, they could assign your bill to transportation if they wanted. They, it doesn't matter. There doesn't have to be a rhyme or reason. Typically, health bills are assigned to the Health Committee, but sometimes you'll have a member that say, I was Chair of Transportation. I say, I, I, I really want this. When I was, I was Vice Chair of the Higher Education Workforce Committee, and there were a number of bills that probably could have gone to the K-12 Education Committee, and I went to the Speaker at the time and said, you know it's my committee? Can you assign it to me? I'm like, yeah, sure. And so they have absolutely authority to assign it to any committee they want, or as many committees as they want. Now, in the House of Origin that you're doing in the Senate or the House, you only have six weeks to get it out of the House before what we do is called a flip. <coughs> and in that, you have to go through every committee the Speaker has assigned you to. You have to go through um, let's let's see the caucus, and I'm going to misspell it. Sorry, public schools, the rules committee, and the entire body or the committee of the whole chamber. All of 
of this must occur within six weeks at the House of Origin. And each one of these, the rules chair, the uh, majority whip, again, just like a committee chair, has absolute authority. And so I saw a number of bills that, again, it's easier to stop a bill than to start a bill. A number of bills in the House that had a majority, they passed the committee, their member was very excited about it, the rules chair just didn't like it. And so what the rules chair would do is, ah, I'm not gonna hear it this week, maybe next week. Ah, maybe next week. And by that time you run up to six weeks. In fact, if you have, just so you know, if you have a rules chair working with the majority leader, or I mean, I'm sorry, the majority whip, in this case, you can kill any bill without killing a bill. And the way you do that is, before the caucus, you just delay that by a couple of weeks, and then the rules chair just delays that by a couple of weeks, and you've eaten two-thirds of your six weeks, and you're done. So that's why it's so important, before you do anything, you do your homework first. You don't just introduce a bill, no one wants to be caught surprised. So if you're going to run a piece of legislation, you will have, if it's going to pass, you will have already met with the stakeholder groups around the state. You have already met with the majority of the members of the House or, and Senate health committees. You have already mentioned it to leadership or at least staff, leadership staff and the governor's policy advisor. Because if any one of those people is caught off guard, the odds are um, the bill's going to die. In fact, my son, uh, who's 11, just brought up a bill. He's like, why doesn't, isn't the uh, Dilophosaurus, why isn't that our state dinosaur? I'm like, well, I saw, look that up, son. And so Hoopenthal actually ran a bill in 1998 to make the source the state dinosaur. And I was like, well, son, why don't we, you want to run a bill? I'll help you run a bill. And we looked at the history of it. That bill died in committee, believe it or not, because someone showed up. They didn't do their homework. It's the Dilophosaurus. Who's against the Dilophosaurus, right? Did you not? Know, this is how bills die. Was discovered in southern Arizona. It should be the Sonorosaurus, not the Dilophosaurus. And the committee broke into an argument about which state dinosaur there should be. And the chair said, this is a ridiculous waste of all our time to build that. <laughs> and I say that because it's so humorous and it, it broke a nine-year-old's heart and it saved my 11-year-old a heartbreak. But because if that happens in open committee on a more serious issue, like a licensure issue or a, a, a liability issue or any of these things, where the nuance affects real money, and you have an opposing group pop up, mm -hmm. at that point your bill is dead. And, and you understand this because you live it. Um, I also own a small business on the side. I understand how important it is to meet the margins and to provide for the customer, and I understand how difficult the regulatory environment can be. And I remember there was a, when I was on judiciary, it was one of the first votes, it was an epiphany. I was the deciding vote, and only the attorneys of this group will get this. But it was a, a, a collateral source evidence, uh, introduction of evidence for a collateral source uh, hearing. It dealt with uh, basically tort reform and, and uh, people suing each other. And all of a sudden it dawned on me as I was researching this issue, my vote is an $80 million vote one way or another. Either the hospitals and trial lawyers are going to benefit by $80 million or the insurance providers are going to benefit by $80 million. There's no way around it. This single vote means $80 million to someone. And all of a sudden it hits you, and it, it, every vote, this is not, and again, no one goes to the legislator typically saying, I'm going to deal with evidentiary uh, admission of evidence and collateral source hearings. No one's going to do that. But all of a sudden, these side issues that are so important to almost no one in the house, but incredibly important to you financially, come up. And that vote in the health committee, they have, and I'll tell you, as a legislative member, like, like I said, you're taking several thousand votes, there would be times that I would be up till three in the morning studying legislation because I had 20 votes at a committee that I had to have something intelligent to say because legislation policy was very important to me. It is very difficult to adjust 20 votes from one committee and then go to the floor and have 50 votes on the floor. That is very, very difficult. And so if you don't have a relationship, an existing relationship with members where they trust you and you can say, look, here's, let's wade through the nuance. This is why this bill is good then you will not be able to get that bill passed. And again, the other thing that I advocate for associations, the reason associations are so important is because of these numbers. It's not just one member that passes a bill. It's 16, 31, and 1. And if you can't impact a member in their district, your conversation is very limited. Typically, just so you know the timeline, in the interim, the really time, the right now is the time to get to know members. Um, if you get five to 10 minutes with a member during the legislative session, you are doing phenomenally well. 
I mean, your day is unbelievably busy. I mean, just to give you a sense of what my life, my, my family is so happy when I lost. I lost by about 100 votes. I looked at my wife, I'm like, I'll bet you didn't even vote for me. She's like, well, I thought about it. <laughs> because my life, I would wake up at 4.30 or 5, go to the gym, I'd be at the Capitol by 7, and I would sit in the Capitol working until at least 7 at night, typically in the same room. And it was just, you'd be bombarded by issues, and then you would go out with usually other members or a lobbyist or someone, and then you'd get back to your apartment at 10 in Phoenix, and then I would basically prepare for the next day for several hours, answering emails, reading legislation. It's an incredibly horrible, hectic life. And that five minutes is gold. I mean, just to give you a sense, there was one time I wanted to go see the sun. There's this thing called the sun. And I went outside, and I very politely, one member said, oh, Representative, can I have a lobbyist? Can I have a few minutes? Yeah, sure. And, and they lined up. I kid you not, they lined up. And I sat there, and I was very gracious, because I'm like, either you're going to talk to me now or my office. I stood outside five, minute, five feet from the front door of the house for a couple hours while people came up, and they just thought, lobbied about this bill or that bill because that's how difficult and important these votes are, and that's how important these legislative relationships are, that you can call someone up and get that five minutes and get through to that five minutes because you have an existing relationship. The other thing that's very important to know as we move through this is every time you talk to someone, it needs to be actionable. <coughs> I'm, I'm, you know, this is something no, I'm not a politician anymore, would ever tell you, but there'd be times that you'd have like eight 15 minute meetings in a row, and if someone came in there was something that was actionable, we need you to vote on this way on this bill or amend this bill in this way, then they could get a commitment and walk away. If they said, do you love kittens? Of course I love kittens. And the next people, do you love children? Of course I love children. And, and you would leave, if you left that meeting without something actionable, you used up your time and you used up their time in an inappropriate way. Because the only reason you are up there is to move legislation during the legislative session. If you want to build a relationship, that's a great time, the interim is a great time to do it, and it's a great time to introduce yourself, but if you're going to take that five minutes and you don't have any issues that you want to talk about, you just want to talk about the good of the order, that's fine, but please be aware that that member is typically not going to remember you, because not that they don't like you, not that they're stupid, but because they are incredibly busy because of the way we've set up our system, and they will have eight meetings just like that right afterwards. And so you've got to do something that stands out, and that is typically, we are running this piece of legislation, we're trying to put this in the budget, can I count on your support, the vote is next week, yes or no? And then you get their support. But just please be aware of that, that that, that is very much, and it's, it's, it's a dirty world in that sense, it's very transactional, it's very, it's very much about how many red and how many green votes you get. So this is the, the House process, and like I said, the, the committee chairs are the most important people to know. So I would highly recommend getting to know Senator Varcho, getting to know Representative Carter, get to know both of them, and just get their sense of what's important. And then we, what we do is we have a flip. So this whole process, if it's in the House, um, it actually, all this legislation goes to the Senate. And it's the exact same process, but this time instead of six weeks, you have four weeks to get it done. There's typically less bills because the, the Chamber of Origin weeds it out, but please be aware, this whole process, now you can expand it by a week or two here or there, but typically you're done in April, this whole week, and they still have to get a budget done, this whole week, or this whole thing, you have 10 to 12 weeks. Now there are other ways and other things that are important. So for example, you can amend a bill, that's very easy to do, and if you know the member, now the other thing that's important to remember, if I am the prime sponsor, the person running the bill, they have complete authority over that bill. And one of my friends actually, on the other side, Ramon Valdez, who's a county supervisor here, he was in the House for eight years, Senate for eight years, and he gave me some good advice when I went up there. He said, you have to be crazier than the rest of them. And so I actually had a bill, it was a police pointers, you know, whether you believe it or not, it's not a felony to point a laser at an aircraft. Who would have thought? So I was changing it, and it got to the Senate, and this is where it really helps to have a member that is 100% committed to you because I was working with the police to do this, and a lobbyist in the Senate amended a bill in the way that I didn't like, and they said, well, this guy's a freshman, he's so excited to pass his bill, he's gonna deal with an amendment he doesn't like. And so I went to that lobbyist, and this was Ramon's advice, taking Ramon's advice, and said, you know what? If you do this to my bill, because he wanted the bill to pass as well, he just wanted his amendment, I will kill my own bill. He's like, no, you won't. I'm like, yes, I will. If that, if that bill is in your name, at any point, you can pull that bill. 
and, and that basically got him back down. It was left ready to go. The governor was going to sign it. It had already passed the House. It was going to go to the Senate. And the Senate president was the one that he was working with to amend it. And I actually said, if you amend my bill, bill's dead. I will, I will withdraw it right now. And they backed down. Bill passed the way that I wanted it to pass. We're all happy. But be aware that whoever has the bill in their name has the authority to do whatever they want with that bill. So if you have a bill that you're very happy with, that's why if you have a member, a legislative ally, make sure they're your ally all the way through. Because they have the ability, if someone comes along and says, you know, Ethan, this bill, I, I love your bill. It helps the caregivers a lot. I'd like it if you added this under your bill. I, as the member running the bill, have the authority to say no thank you or yes please. So that's why it's so important to pick your legislative allies because they're the ones that ultimately control the bill. The other thing, and this is where it gets very important when you get to the one, as you can imagine, because it's such a condensed timeline, if the governor chooses to veto your bill, there, you have to go back and do this whole process again, except it's two-thirds instead of a majority. That sounds okay in theory. It is impossible within a 10-week time frame. To my knowledge, I've never seen a gubernatorial veto overridden simply because of this time frame. So be aware, if the governor does not like your bill, in addition to pushing against a headwind, because people are going to ask, what is the governor on this? You will, your bill is not going to pass. And so typically, there are health policy advisors. Those are great people just to know. And those are great people to be made aware before you even introduce the legislation. Because if the governor wants to change something, if the governor wants more information, it's better to get that to the governor before the bill makes it out of the chamber of origin. Because if it doesn't, now you're scrambling to make the governor happy. And so every piece of legislation I ever ran, it wasn't necessarily the governor, but it was the governor's staff. And I said, hey, is the governor going to have a problem with this? No, yes. What do I need to do to make the governor happy? So you want to secure this before you even start the process. The other reason it's so important, because this is just passing legislation. That's actually a very small portion of what happens in Phoenix. You have the regulatory, the administrative department of health services, which is an incredibly influential body. They're influential because they can make administrative decisions that affect all of our day-to-day -day lives, as we all know. They have the inspection and the oversight authority. But then the other thing that's so important about them is members trust them. So it's not just about the members. It's about the policy advisory staff. That's why a relationship with whoever, like Kobe Bauer, the, the lobbyist for the Department of Health Services, is so important. Because if you're running a legislation, and Chris Ackle is running it for you, and it goes through, the odds are he's going to call the Department of Health Services or Tom Betlack at Access and say, what do you think of this bill? Oh, you don't like it. Oh, you do. That's important. And then the policy people, again, the governor and the House side, very, very important. The other thing that's very important to understand is the budget is the budget that the, le the, the real state budget is about $27 billion. The budget that we pass is about $9.3 billion because the government takes out the, the pass-throughs. Um, in that budget, you can actually change legislation. So be aware of that. There are many bills or many laws that are created, it's called session law, that are just added onto the budget. So if you can tie it to the budget, that may be the easiest way to get something passed. With that, I really, truly appreciate your time.